Hardcore Podcast, back for another week. We had our first video episode on YouTube last week. We're doing this again. If you're listening on Spotify, Apple, you can go to the Break Hard YouTube channel, find it there. But we are here to talk about the NASCAR street races in Chicago for both the Xfinity and the Cup Series teams. We had IndyCar at Mid-Ohio, and we had F1 in Austria. Spoiler alert, Max wins again. But we're going to start off with Chicago because it was new, right? We've never seen NASCAR the Cup Series and the Xfinity Series, at least, race on a street course. And we finally saw it, and it was better than expected, absolutely. I I think everybody is skeptical going into the weekend, right? After all, this is NASCAR. I don't think a lot of us put a ton of faith into them producing a good product on a new track, especially with what we've seen on road courses in the last couple of years. The fanning out, trying to get into the corners, the beating, the banging, it just kind of looks like a clown show out there most of the times. Everyone else kind of laughs about it. It's just not very representative of uh, a major racing series. However, the Chicago street race had absolutely none of that. It had good racing all day. You had a damp track going to a dry-ish track. You had a guy in his first career Cup Series start in Shane Van Gisbergen uh, winning the race, absolutely putting a clinic on on how to drive on a street course. You had accidents, you had passing, you had strategy, you had the daylight going away. It was everything that NASCAR could have wanted. The stands, there were people all around that racetrack, four and five deep at times, trying to just get a glimpse of these cars going around. Absolutely fantastic shots. The, the shot of the cars coming up over the uh, train bridge uh, into the final corner with you could look down well i don't know what street that was but you could look down uh behind them and see just streets of chicago people driving just living normal lives the l going past people crossing the street it was it was just really cool to see visually looked absolutely amazing nascar wanted this to be an event and it absolutely was an event i saw adam stern tweeted on monday morning that nascar was uh 15 minutes away from postponing that race until monday some would argue maybe they should have because it's going to be dry and sunny on Monday in Chicago. But at the same time, I think you needed to get it in on Sunday night because of that TV window. NASCAR marketed this event as being on NBC at 5 o'clock. Initially, it was supposed to be a 5.54 p.m. start time. With a perfect sunny day, you get all 100 laps in because the daylight's going to last longer. Uh, unfortunately, even starting... Uh, at the same time that they did, 6 o'clock with the low cloud cover, it did not give them a ton of daylight to get things done. And the race was shortened from 100 laps to 75 laps. But overall, absolutely loved this race. Hope they can go back next year. NASCAR obviously says that they want to. They have a three-year deal uh, with an option for two years after that. So potentially five years in a row. Uh, obviously, they have a new mayor in Chicago and Brandon Johnson who seemed skeptical when he took office, but now seems like he's changed his tune a little bit. I think the only thing that might change in terms of if this race happens again is you might see NASCAR in Chicago maybe try to renegotiate the terms of this deal. But I think it was beneficial for both parties, right? NASCAR got to have their street race in the third biggest media market in the country. Chicago got shown off. To, to NASCAR fans, this whole lead up to this event, all we heard about from the, I'll just call them, you know, your traditional NASCAR fans was how this race is going to be so bad, how there's going to be violence, how teams were scared to go. You saw that rosy cheek spotter from South Carolina. He was tweeting out that teams were, you know, instructed to use the buddy system, walk to the track together. Uh, people were getting robbed at gunpoint, still haven't seen actual proof of that because it didn't happen everybody's going to get robbed cars are going to get stolen you're going to need a humvee with bulletproof uh armor to get to the spotter stand just all these people saying that you're all these bad things because they don't understand what chicago is and chicago absolutely showed up for nascar this weekend you have fans there uh that could not look more excited to be there you have people walking around town asking what teams uh, crew members were working for, they were going to a race for the first time, they were just happy to see it in Chicago, like, it was an event in every, you know, part of the imagination, it was, I blanked out right there, I'm gonna be completely honest, I lost my train of thought halfway through that, but we're leaving it in, um, it was absolutely what NASCAR needed, and then to have a guy like Shane Van Gisbergen come in, 
and I'll be honest, Rick Allen and all the boys at NBC, they fought with how to pronounce Shane's name like Mike Tyson fights the English language. They hadn't a clue how to pronounce his name. To the point where I think Rick Allen was so self-conscious about how he was pronouncing his name, he just kept going, Van Gisbergen! And he was just saying it quickly, just making Van Gisbergen all into just one syllable. Van Gisbergen! And he was just spewing it out. Steve Letarte, he just doesn't even know letters. He was trying to say SVG, and he kept being like, SVJ! Because G's and J's, admittedly, are a bit confusing at times for some people. And Steve... He was just fighting a mental battle all day, and he was trying to win, and I'll be honest, he was not winning. Steve, or Rick wasn't winning. Dale Earnhardt Jr. kind of got it down. Uh, Mike Bagley probably had it the best. I'm pretty sure Jeff Burton called him Van Ginsburg in 1,200 times. Poor Shane. He, people were just butchering his name left and right, and I'll be honest, it's not that difficult to say. If you could say Keselowski, you can say Van Ginsburg. It's pretty simple. But, man, did they, they were struggling. Either way, he comes in, three-time Australian Supercars champion, 79 wins uh, down there on that tour. Comes over, makes his first NASCAR career, <laughs> Cup Series start, and wins the race. Did something Jamie McMurray couldn't do. Wins in his second start ever. It was, or wins in his first start ever. Jamie won in his second start ever when he subbed for Sterling Marlin at the Charlotte Fall Race. E either way, absolutely incredible story. He... What He is the only guy in the field that has experience driving a full-bodied stock car on a street race, street course, whatever you want to call it. He does this every single year, multiple times a year on the Supercars Tour, and guess what? He's really good at it. And he drives a car that shares some of the same characteristics as the Gen 7 Cup car, right? Independent rear suspension, sequential gearbox. He was clutching um, on his downshifts, which he didn't have to do, but he was... He was using it to slow the car down, which uh, I would argue it had helped him just probably enough, right? Nobody else was doing that. Absolute incredible footwork. Now, uh, NBC and Fox love to put foot cams in cars on road courses, and there's really no point in doing it with your Cup Series regulars because they don't do the footwork that a Borsch said used to do or uh, what Shane was doing on Sunday. It's just masterclass to watch. If you've ever driven... A manual car uh, especially tried to drive it spiritedly you can appreciate what he was doing with his feet on Sunday because it was just again a master class in in how to handle one of these cars he goes out there looks really good in practice qualifies p3 and kind of just settled in early in the race right he, he ran in third I think he dropped back to fourth at one point just kind of rode and then towards the second half of that race his car came to life, and then they put a bunch of guys in front of him, thanks to some questionable call by NASCAR and a pit stop sequence, put some guys in front of him that probably didn't really have any business of running up front, definitely didn't, but because track position is so important, you could pass, you could definitely pass. You just had to set them up correctly and not make mistakes yourself, which we saw a ton of people making mistakes. But he was able to just pick his way through. He restarted, I believe, in 11th or 10th, picked his way through, got back to the lead, and was able to go on and, and win the race, which was, I don't know if it was unexpected. I guess it was unexpected, right? Nobody expects him, nobody expected him to win, right? Guys don't come into the Cup Series and win in their first start. But nobody has really come into the Cup Series and had the same experience he does with a car that's relatively similar on a track that he's super comfortable on that style of track. So that begs the question of, and I saw a ton of people asking this, and Jordan Bianchi from The Athletics said it, but he is a bit of a fool 95% of the time. Is this embarrassing that he beat the NASCAR Cup Series regulars in his first start? And a ton of people are like, well, this proves NASCAR drivers can't drive, blah, blah, blah. And I'll be honest, it's not embarrassing. It's not that NASCAR drivers can't drive. It's because he's very good on this style of track. In this type of car, he's very good. Sure, he's never driven one of these cars before. But again, it shares a lot of the same characteristics of the cars he's driven. He's not scared of the walls that are on either side of him that entire lap. He's done this a hundred times. Turning into the corner, he absolutely knows what to do. He's not scared of clipping the corner like a Chase Elliott did in practice when he was trying to follow SVG. He was trying to keep up with him. He just couldn't. And then he tried to cut the corner just a little bit tighter than he normally did, clips the inside corner on the apex, and then it shoots him out into the outside wall 
uh, going into that that roundabout section there. So, I mean, Chase Elliott's one of the better NASCAR Cup Series drivers on a road course, right? Um, was he... Did he benefit a lot from that Hendrick track attack program? That wasn't a testing program, but it just happened to coincide with Hendrick's dominance on road courses. Yeah, absolutely. He definitely did. And now that it's a more level playing field and you can't have that track attack program with the Gen 7 characteristics that we currently have, we've seen him come back down to like a rather pedestrian level. Probably could have won Watkins Glen last year. Uh, it was obviously between him and Kyle Larson. But other than that, he's been there. He just hasn't been that dominant factor that we've seen in the past you have a guy like Shane come in and again it's not embarrassing that he goes out there and wins unexpected sure but at the same time you shouldn't be that surprised he kept his nose clean obviously a lot of things benefited him on Sunday and this isn't to shortchange what he did at all because what he did was absolutely incredible it, obviously we had the car that shares some of the same characters as him. You have a street course. He also benefited massively from a drying racetrack, multiple surface types, multiple surface types. And he goes in there and then he got super lucky thanks to NASCAR going with a single file, going with a single file start and restart throughout the entire race. That helped out massively, especially on a green white checker where he was able to to control the start. He was able to gas it up, get enough of a gap on Justin Haley that Justin couldn't dive into the corner and and turn him, and he benefited a ton from that. So, yeah, Shane did everything he needed to do. The team absolutely did everything they needed to do. I was, I was listening to his radio at one point early in the race, and he was like, he radioed the team and said, guys, the voltage is flashing on the digital dash. It's reading 12.3. And the team, like, there was a long pause, and then, I don't know if it was Darren Greb or one of the engineers, came over the radio and said, hey, uh, there's a switch to your left. If it's flipped down, flip it up. And he's like, okay, I flipped it up. Voltage is going back up. It's reading correctly now. And they said, all right, you turned off the alternator, <laughs> which, not ideal. So, just some learning pains, right? And thankfully, nothing bad happened to that car. I know a lot of people were talking about him using the clutch on the uh, to slow the car down. I was really concerned about that, uh, especially late into the race, to see if it was going to stand up to the pressures, right? And it did. It did its job, which was super great to see. But overall, absolutely incredible that he won. He's now qualified for the All-Star Race next year. I don't know what the supercar schedule is going to look like for 2024, but I would love to see him come over and do it. I, Justin Mark said that they don't have any more plans this year for the Project 91 car. I hope that they are able to get him back over to maybe run... I don't know, the Roval or I think I think the Indianapolis road course is on an off weekend for them. Again, don't know if he wants to do that or if they can get a, a deal together for that, but would love to see it. Speaking of him running more races, in his post-race interview on NBC, he was asked, do you want to come do this full time, basically? And he said, I've got another year to do down in Oz, and then he wants to come over here full time. He's 34 years old right now, so that means he would be 36, 35 ish, 35, 36 by the time he comes over to race full time. That's late, right? I mean, you're talking about maybe, maybe 10 years of of good time. But I hope he does because that man put on an absolute show on Sunday. And it was great to see. I don't know why people would be complaining about it. It was a good race on a good track that I think all of us were skeptical on. NASCAR using local yellows was super nice. There were maybe a bit too many incidents, which we'll talk about in a second. He did it with a crew chief that has now taken Casey Mears to victory lane. He has a Daytona 500 win as a substitute with Jimmy Johnson at Cup Series Championship as he was getting fired with Tony Stewart. And now he wins the inaugural street race for the NASCAR Cup Series with a guy that's never been in the damn car before. That's pretty cool. So shout out to Darian Grubb because there's nobody else right now that, that has a as diverse of a resume that he does, which is very odd. But overall, super happy that SVG won. I don't know how you can be upset about that. It's a good story, and it's something that we'll likely never see again, at least in their first career Cup Series start. So maybe just appreciate that the guy's just a hell of a wheel man. Speaking of accidents, like I mentioned before, there are a number of accidents, right? And NASCAR put up tire barriers all around the track, which is pretty typical with the street course. 
and we had guys absolutely sending it into the tires. Tyler Reddick got stuck in the tires, Martin Truex Jr., Kyle Busch, No Graxon three times, I think, maybe did. No Graxon's going to have nightmares of turn six at Chicago for the rest of his life. If I'm Wendy's, I'm sponsoring that corner next year just to get double exposure. So when you slide in the Baconator car with Noah Gragson, there's also just big Wendy's signage right there um, for it. Obviously, this was the home race of McDonald's, but I'll, I'll be honest, that, Mc, or that Wendy's car got a ton of TV time because Noah, maybe that was Noah's plan the whole time, just getting that exposure for the sponsor. He's definitely wishing that it was, was um, the offseason already, though, because... That guy just wanted to go home at this point. But, yeah, I don't think there was any major incidents where you're like, oh, that, that seemed not safe. Obviously, we had Kevin Harvick and Chase Elliott getting into the wall in practice and qualifying. Pretty hard. They both moved the wall, uh, which is not great. But then you had, in the race, guys getting into the tires, and the tires ate a lot of that um, energy, they just got stuck underneath them, which there's nothing you can really do about that other than maybe anchoring the tires to the ground, but then that's not the safest thing in the world to do, so don't do that. Yeah, there was, again, no major incident. Bubba got loose getting down into turn one and ended up bodying Ricky Stenhouse Jr., putting him into the wall. I did love the radio-style broadcast because Mike Bagley would just be like, Oh, the 22 spinning down here. And then they would have to cut to the camera. Actually, they didn't cut to the 22 spinning. But he was just screaming. And then all of a sudden, the camera would just cut. And you'd just see somebody buried into the tires, which was interesting. <laughs> uh, Chris Bell also managed to get into the tires. Bad day for JGR. Denny Hamlin gets the pole. Gets passed immediately by Christopher Bell on the first. Or no, Tyler Reddick on the first lap. My apologies. And then Denny puts it into the tires. Coming out of turn seven maybe I don't know what turn that was I gotta learn all these turns still and was able to get it going again but he lost uh that coveted top three spot and ended up being back in 12th place and kind of never really recovered from there uh I don't actually know where he finished at but I will find out because that's why you guys come to listen to this podcast you want accurate information and like the local weather station I'm here to give it to you so let me pull this up Denny managed to finish 11th. Yeah, he basically just hung out there for the rest of the day. Uh, you had, uh, obviously, SVG winning. Justin Haley finishes second. Benefited a ton from that NASCAR call to shorten the race after maybe some people had already pitted and affect the strategy. Kyle Busch said that his team specifically pitted when they did to play into the strategy in the hopes that this race is going to get shortened because of darkness. It did get shortened, and he was correct, so that benefited them a lot. On the other hand, it hurt guys like Christopher Bell, who and Adam Stevens came over the radio and said they fucked us, which they kind of did, but at the same time, SVG was on the same strategy as them and was able to drive back through the field and win the race. So it wasn't impossible, but Justin Haley's finish was not indicative of where he was running. Neither was Chase Elliott's. Kyle Larson actually was. And he was, he was the other guy that was on that same strategy as SVG and uh, Chris Bell. He managed to finish fourth, Kyle Busch fifth, Austin Sendrick sixth, Michael McDowell seventh, Joey Logano eighth, Ty Gibbs ninth, and Chris Buescher rounds out your top ten. Uh, Corey LaJoy finishes P14. Good run for him. Eric Jones gets 16th. Ryan Priest 15th. Uh, Jensen Button, who qualified in the top ten, looked really good in practice uh, and qualifying there until... That final round finishes 21st. He spun coming to pit road, or got spun coming to pit road, thanks to um, Christopher Bell. Alex Bowman blew up. They decided to ignore that oil light on the dash, which you should never ignore. If your oil light comes on in your car, definitely check your oil and um, maybe schedule an oil change if you don't do it yourself. Or you can do it yourself. Just get a couple drive-ups, pop that oil, bolt out of the bottom of the engine or wherever it's at located on your car, definitely on the bottom. If you're in a Ford, it's likely going to be messy as shit. Drain the oil out into an oil pan, put the plug back in, go up to the top, pour the oil back in, you're done, in, out, pretty simple. Unless you don't want to get dirty. Then just take it to an oil change place. I'm just trying to help you guys out here. Just trying to save some money for you. I don't know how much an oil change is, honestly, to go get it done because I just change it in my garage. But, again, just trying to help. Martin Truex Jr. finishes 32nd, bad day for him. Ryan Blaney, also bad day, 33rd. Ty Dillon, 
carrying the White Sox cars. Shout out to White Sox Dave from Barstool, who walking past the 77 car on pit road said, I don't have faith in this guy carrying the White Sox uh, paint scheme <laughs> today. He was not wrong. He knows nothing about NASCAR, but even he knew the 77 car with Ty Dillon was just not going to get it done. And then Austin Dillon, who was running second, trying to chase down Justin Haley, trying to get that win. And I'll be honest, if, if Austin Dillon would have won the Chicago Street Course, I would have rioted. Because that man would have, again, <laughs> lucked into another win. His first career win comes in the um, Coke 600, a few miles race. He wins that. Second win comes at the Daytona 500 thanks to a massive crash. He gets put up to the front. Granted, he drives through the 10 of Eric Almirola, wins the race. His third career win, the Texas race with the NA18 D package where there was absolutely no passing. He gets himself out into the lead based off a of pit strategy from Pit Row AI. Shout out to them. Gets himself into the lead. Nobody can pass him. Wins the race. Daytona Summer Race last year, the entire field crashes because it's raining in turn one. All he has to do is beat a broken, beat up 22 car of Austin Cindric and maybe Ryan Blaney. I can't remember off the top of my head. And is able to do that celebrates like he just won the Daytona 500 again. If he would have won the Chicago Street Race because he benefited from NASCAR shortening the race and they just happened to have pitted at the right time, I would have lost my mind. But that didn't happen, thankfully. He absolutely pounded the wall, smartly got off the racetrack, was able to just drive backwards on pit road, which was actually really beneficial, and I'm glad that he was able to get off the track like that. Was the race shortening fair or not? It was something NASCAR absolutely had to do because they were going to run into darkness. Should they have just run the race until they couldn't anymore? Until they had to make a call when it was dark out, red flag the race, and then call it from there. That way, you don't have guys specifically trying to get the strategy going. I would argue that you could do that. But at the same time, like uh, it may be, that would maybe tend to lean into maybe a more random winner. Um, so I don't necessarily love it, but it is an option, right? At the same time, I'm fine with how they did it, just from a standpoint of the guys that were screwed by the strategy there, Chris Rebell, SVG, on back, it gave them enough time to rebound from that. And obviously, SVG and Larson did. They both got top five finishes. One got the win. So, yeah. Overall, super impressed with this race. I think we were all really nervous going in because we didn't want to see a shit show happen obviously we saw a macau style pile up and complete track blockage when kevin harvick spun and blocked the entire racetrack but it got cleared up really quickly so it wasn't really that embarrassing it just shit happens overall hope they go back next year hope chicago lets them come back nascar obviously is talking to other cities about hosting street races I see a future where there's two street races on the schedule, one for the Fox portion of the schedule, one for the NBC portion of the schedule, unless like Amazon Prime desperately wants a street race and their little six race schedule, that could be a possibility as well. But I think what we saw was absolutely fantastic. Maybe start it earlier next year. Uh, hopefully there's not a biblical amount of rain again, but overall super happy with what we saw from the Cup Series. Moving on to the Xfinity Series race, we had the Xfinity race on Saturday, which they tried to finish on Sunday, ultimately ended up not, and making an unprecedented call, at least in NASCAR. So the race actually ended up only being 55 miles, 25 laps, 55 miles, not the best thing overall. Cole Custer ends up winning. The race never got to the completion of Stage 2, which makes a race official. And that's where you have a judgment call made by NASCAR, an unprecedented move to call a race before it was deemed official by the rule books. There is a clause in the NASCAR rule book that essentially says that NASCAR can make judgment calls, obviously because their judge, jury, and executioner are all in one. They can do whatever they want. So they decided to make the call, being two laps short, only two laps short of an official race distance at the end of stage two. They called the race. Cole Custer ends up winning his second win of the year, second win on a road course. Nah, I'm so torn on this, right? I know why they did it. I see why they did it. I'm conflicted on why they did it because it. I don't love the setting a precedent for this happening again in the future. But at the same time, there is absolutely no way they could have taken Xfinity cars out on track on Saturday, Sunday, um, when it started to rain. So Saturday's race was obviously hampered by all of the lightning and just 
it just never stopped. It sucks that that's how it was decided and definitely left a bad taste in everybody's mouth because I think of the 55 laps that they ran, no, of the 25 laps they ran, my bad, 55 miles, 25 laps, of those 25 laps, nine of those laps were under caution. So it's only 16 green flag laps and it felt just like a very, very broken up race. I mean, the longest green flag run was eight laps. And it just never really felt like it got going, which is a bummer because I think that the Xfinity cars would have put on a really good show on the street course. It just didn't end up happening, which is, like I said, unfortunate. Cole Custer wins. John Hunter Nemechek finishes second. Justin Allgaier third. Brett Moffitt uh, fourth. Austin Hill fifth. Sammy Smith sixth. Daniel Hemrick P7. Chandler Smith eighth. Parker Kligerman ninth. And Kaz Grawl rounding out your top ten. You had um, Jesse Awuji's team... Made a surprise appearance. They're back from the dead. Um, with Andre Castro behind the wheel of the car. And he subsequently absolutely totaled that 34 Chevrolet. So not ideal for them. Justin Marks, owner of Trackhouse, driving the 10 car for college. Looked really good in practice. Qualified 12th. Had a lot of speed. And then blew the car up on lap 3. Just absolutely grenaded that thing. Not ideal for him. Uh, Cole Custer's win, though, does put him, help him out in the championship a ton. John Hunter Nemechek still leads the way with 638 points. Austin Hill in second, but his wins out. I don't actually know. Hang on. Racing, racing reference doesn't do the points very well, right? So let me get oh, NASCAR pulled up here. Again, you guys come here for... You come here for all the correct information. I'm here to give it to you. Let me view the playoff standings for the Xfinity Series. Oh, John Hunter Nemechek has two wins on the season, but he has four stage wins, and he has 2,029 points. Austin Hill, three wins on the season, uh, three stage wins. He has... 2,028 points right now as it stands if the pl uh, playoffs were to start today. Cole Custer's in third. Justin Allgaier fourth. Uh, Chandler Smith. Sammy Smith. Jeb Burton uh, is in the top 12 right now. Josh Berry, Sheldon Creed, Sam Mayer, Daniel Hemrick, Riley Herbst. Parker Clearman is on the outside looking in. He is 26 points below the cut line. Brett Moffitt is 68 points below the cut line. And Brandon Jones having an abysmal year is 74 points below the cut line. Those guys are all basically in must-win scenarios. As we are approaching the um, the latter half of the regular season here with the Xfinity Series. Let me see here. The Xfinity Series has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 races actually until their playoffs. There's still some time there. The Cup Series is much closer to their playoffs. The truck series is going to start their playoffs like, I don't know, in three races, which is a bit ridiculous. Maybe two races? Truck series starts their playoffs in three races at IRP. So, yeah, that'll be interesting. But that's where we stand with that. All right. Been talking about NASCAR for almost a half an hour now. We should probably move on and just recap the open wheel racing. Alex Pillow wins again his fourth win in the last five races four road course races in a row for him throwing this detroit street course as well it's alex Plow's world we're just living in it he's obviously moving to mclaren next year he told chip ganassi he'd take his four million dollars a year and shove it basically he wants a formula one ride if you're a formula one team though i guess you not i guess you have to be calling him right you got to be trying to set up a test or at the very least, just putting him under a contract because I think the guy has absolutely got it. In terms of Spanish open wheel drivers right now, it's Fernando Alonso, Alex Pillow, Carlos Sainz. Alex Pillow absolutely should be in Formula 1. He's gunning for Nick DeVries' seat at Alpha Tauri or Toro Rosso, whatever it becomes next year. Uh, Alfa Romeo told his, his management team to piss off, stop coming around because we're annoyed by you guys. So his realistically, his only options are Williams and maybe replacing Logan Sargent or getting in at Alpha Tauri, replacing Nick DeVries. I don't see anywhere else where he can possibly end up at unless Haas wants to take a flyer on him, but Haas doesn't 
do anything that would maybe sort of benefit American, do anything that would, you know, even remotely benefit American motorsports. So it's kind of where we stand at the moment with Alex Pillow. But again, just goes out there and lays it on him. Had a seven second lead, just drives away from him. He's just so good right now. It's it's in, it's in, not embarrassing because sometimes dudes just hit on it. He and Barry Wanzer, his engineer, are just on another one right now. Scott Dixon finished second. Will Power finished third. Benjamin Peterson made zero friends on Sunday. He blocked Pillow, the leader, for a long time. Almost allowed Colton Herter to catch up to him. Then he proceeded to just block anybody else that tried to pass him. The McLarens, Scott McLaughlin, Scott Dixon. I mean, this kid was just blocking everybody for no apparent reason at all. To the point where McLaren went down to Chevrolet and was like, move him the fuck out of the way. And he just decided not to listen. So that's his prerogative. And Scott McLaughlin's a pretty level-headed guy. And he went down and just got in Benjamin Peterson's face and was like, you're not making any friends out here doing this, so stop it. I don't know what that kid's thinking. It's not working for him. So, yeah, that was very odd. But we'll see what happens there. Either way, it was it was a good race. It's mid-Ohio. It's always good. It always delivers. You had an absolutely massive accident on Saturday at mid-Ohio. Simon Pagano loses his brake. He had brake failure at the end of the straightaway. The back stretch goes sideways, ramps off, basically, which that has to absolutely get fixed right there. Flies into the gravel, flips probably a dozen times. Thankfully, was able to climb out under his own power. Was not clear to race on Sunday. Uh, if you take a hit over 80 Gs, IndyCar will not clear you to race the next day. That happened to him, so Connor Daly was tabbed as sub for him. Connor Daly's poor mom had a sprint from Indianapolis to Lexington, Ohio, and bring him his helmet and his uh, shoes and Nomex and everything. The team got him a fire suit, which was pretty cool. He goes from 27th to finish P20, right behind the car that he was fired from. So make of that what you will. Uh, obviously, Shank has had a struggle this year, so it was um, less than not not the easiest car to get in and drive right on short notice with only a morning warm up on Sunday morning to really get a feel for the car. But I think Connor showed that he's still. Uh, unfortunately, he's not going to get a full-time ride unless he brings some money. But, yeah, I, I don't know. It was a good race overall. Colton Herta, again, probably should have had a podium finish, but he comes to pit road, running in second. Pit lane speed limiter doesn't work, ends up speeding on pit road, has to serve a penalty, doesn't get it done. First lap of the race, you had uh, Swede on Swede violence as Marcus Erickson understeered into Felix Rosenquist, went up and over the top of him, ruined both of their days. Marcus was able to come back out like 49 laps down, pulls out onto the track, and then race control is like, hey, you have a 45-second uh, stop and hold for causing a collision on the opening lap, which is kind of just like throwing salt into the wound there, which is not ideal for him. But, but uh, yeah, it was – those are the two big major ones. Colton Herta and his team just have to get it figured out. It's always something that derails a good run for them. Graham Rahal started second, had a long pit stop that dropped into P7, but still a top 10 for for him. And I believe they had uh, both two of their cars in the top 10, and he and Christian Lungard. But I will double check that real quick. Yeah, Christian Lungard finishes P4, great run for him. Graham finishes P7, and then Jack Harvey P18. But a good rebound for RLL. David Malukas finishes P6. He sounds like he's not going to be back at coin next year, which is kind of interesting because HMD and Coin have partnered up. So he's taken his dad's uh, shipping magnet money and moving over to potentially Chip Ganassi Racing. We'll see what happens there. Meyer Shank, I feel like, could be in play there too. We'll see though. But good run for him overall. Pato finishes eighth. Marcus Armstrong, P9, setting himself again um, away as there, he's... Leading the uh, rookie points battle, he's not running the ovals, so he's going to miss three more races this year, but he still could win, which, say what you want about the rookie class this year, then. But overall, good re good weekend of racing. Week off before they're in Toronto for the street race up there. Strictly on Peacock, solely on Peacock, I should say, and I believe, believe Lee Diffie said it would be commercial free, so 
we'll have to see what happens there. So if you don't have the cock, tune in, sign up, do all the things. Formula One race at the Red Bull Ring in Austria. It was um, a typical 2023 Formula One race. Max Verstappen gets the pole. Max Verstappen wins the race. Max Verstappen gets the fastest lap. Max Verstappen just continues to lead the points and do all the things that Max Verstappen does. Not a very exciting race um, from that standpoint. Track limits absolutely wreaked havoc. You had guys getting multiple penalties. After the race, Aston Martin protested the classification because they said that not enough people were penalized. And from the FIA said, you are correct. There were more penalties to be had so they reviewed 1200 different incidents of people going and violating track limits after the race they handed out more time penalties yuki sonoda lewis hamilton carlos Sainz, esteban Ocon got like 30 seconds of penalties added on to his race and uh yeah it was less than ideal the fia did recommend to the track that they install gravel traps on the exit of turn nine and the exit of turn 10 which I think we all will agree that they absolutely should do, or a driver should just stay in the damn limits of the track. It, I mean, it's just form, Formula 1 this year is just so taxing because it's just Max winning and nobody else really having a chance. Uh, Sergio Perez, he pissed down his leg in Monaco, and he's just never recovered. He, he'll, he's done. He's mentally broken. He's not going to win this championship. I'd be shocked if he wins another race uh, this year. I would argue that if Daniel Ricciardo's three-day test that they have for him this summer at Red Bull goes well, that you just make the change for next year. Because at this point, Sergio couldn't do anything in the sprint. He does rebound to finish in the um, on the podium in the uh, race. But at the same time, like, you should. You're in the fastest car in the field. You absolutely should be finishing on the podium. I'd argue you should have finished second ahead of Charles Leclerc, but he doesn't, and um, yeah, Lando Norris finishes fourth, Fernando Alonso fifth, Sainz sixth, George seventh, Lewis eighth, Lance Stroll ninth, and Pierre Gasly rounds out your top ten. Alex Albon continues to give that Williams an absolute great ride uh, with an 11th place finish, but overall, it was fine. The sprint race was fine. It, it, the sprint race is exciting because you had varying track conditions. People going off enters, putting slicks on, and trying to make up time, which, honestly, they all ended up finishing where they would have finished at basically anyways if they would have just stayed out on enters. But it at least gave us some excitement. George Russell's four seconds a lap faster than people. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know. Formula 1 this year is just so taxing because we just know what's going to happen every single weekend. Mercedes and McLaren are both bringing big upgrades to Silverstone this upcoming weekend. We'll see what happens there, but that's probably going to be the last major development for the year. And then we have one more race until the summer break, off for three weeks, come back, and then we'll just continue this out until Max finally wins the championship with probably like five races to go. Because at this point, he has, let me see the driver's standings. Max has a three race lead over Sergio already, and a three and a half, well, almost four race lead over. Fernando Alonso in third. So this championship is almost all but wrapped up and we're not even to the summer break yet. So that's a bit disappointing, but as it stands right now, he would wrap up the championship in Mexico on October 27th. The way things are going, <laughs> he could easily wrap up the championship in Japan round 17 and there'd still be six races to go after that. I would not be shocked to see that happen. Uh, it'd be very Michael Schumacher-esque to wrap up a championship that early. Even Lewis wrapped up some championships pretty early, too. But, yeah, there it was just a bummer. Um, just want to see more competitive racing, obviously, right? Like, the mid-pack was good. There was some good battling happening there. But overall, it was just disappointing is the only word that just keeps coming to mind. Either way, we're moving on to the next weekend. We have... The NASCAR Cup and Xfinity Series are headed off to Atlanta. It will be a 7 p.m. Sunday night start. Sunday night NASCAR back again for the Cup Series. The Xfinity Series will be Sunday afternoon, I believe, from Atlanta as well. We also have the Truck Series. I'm going to look at the uh, schedule for the 8th. 
No, the Xfinity race will be a night race, 8 p.m. start on USA. Truck Series are in action on Saturday as well at Mid-Ohio. Why Mid-Ohio is running IndyCar the weekend prior and then Trucks the next weekend, I have no idea. ARCA and Trucks will both be at Mid-Ohio. Um, IndyCar is off and Formula One is running the British Grand Prix at Silverstone. So tune in to all of that. I think we recapped everything. Days of Thunder 2 possibly happening. If you haven't seen that, watch the video on YouTube that I posted of it. And yeah, like and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Follow me on TikTok at BreakHard. And follow me on Twitter and Instagram at BreakHardBlog. Who knows how long Twitter's gonna be around. If Elon will just pay his debts, maybe we could all get back to seeing more than 600 tweets a day. Either way, uh, we'll keep hanging out there until a new alternative comes along and then we'll bounce over there and have more fun on that section of the internet. But until then, I'll see you guys next time.